Welcome, everyone. We're very uh, pleased that you could join us today. We have an exceptional speaker that we're really uh, pleased to introduce today, Dr. Carl Schreck. Um, Carl is somebody that uh, many of you may know by name. Maybe you even know him when you took uh, some graduate courses uh, in fisheries, Moyle and Schreck, um, methods for fish biology. Uh, Carl received his zoology uh, bachelor's of Science from University of California at Berkeley, um, his master's and his PhD at uh, Colorado State University. From there, he uh, spent two and a half or so years at Virginia Tech as a first faculty position. Uh, and as he just shared, he um, is from the West Coast and always had a, a real uh, interest in, in living in Oregon, even though he didn't really know what that was like. And he got a position with the co-op unit. At that time, it was Fish and Wildlife. It later became USGS. And he had an exceptional career. And that began in 1975 uh, at Oregon State University in the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Sciences, as you see there on the title slide. Um, he um, retired six years ago. But um, you can see by his, and you will learn by this presentation today, that he's remained extremely active um, and uh, it, as he, he said, he just doesn't get paid anymore for it. So um, so we're really, really pleased to have him here. He's published more than 300 journal articles and some books, as I showed. He's been cited more than 12,000 times based on the web of science. Um, for those people that care about these things, he has an H index of 60, which is really large. That means he has at least 60 papers that have been cited at least 60 times. And he's really considered a global expert on the effects of stress on fish health. Um, he's got a lot of awards. Uh, the two that are the most important or meaningful, I think, first in 2008, President George W. Bush awarded him the Presidential Meritorious Professional Service Award. Um, and uh, previously in 2000, uh, many of his students nominated him for the Educator of the Year Award for the American Fishery Society. And um, I, I know that meant a lot to, to Carl to receive that national award for what he does in the classroom. And of course, we'll hear more today about uh, what he does from a research perspective. We really we reached out to the Oregon Hatchery Research Center um, because of some connections that we had in the Great Lakes from people that were aware of what they're doing with respect to sort of conservation hatchery practices um, and something that we could uh, potentially learn more about in the Great Lakes to help with some of our conservation and restoration programs. Um, that Oregon Hatchery Research Center was something that uh, um, Carl had a, an important role in sort of planning it. And then uh, the implementation uh, was done um, also by uh, David Noakes, but I know Carl is also really involved in some of the things he's going to be talking about today. This idea of trying to create fish in the wet lab, in the lab, or in an aquaculture facility that are retain as many of the wildlife characters that they can. So, uh, Carl, again, thank you so much for joining, and we hope that everybody will stay on for uh, a nice discussion and question and answer session uh, at the end of his talk. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for that introduction, Bo. And uh, good morning, everybody, or I guess good noon to uh, to you guys where you are. Um, like uh, Bo mentioned, I'll be talking about work we've been doing trying to create fish that are sort of reverse engineer. Basically, what we're doing is bringing wild fish into a culture facility and then growing them so they turn out to be what they were when we brought them in there in the first place. So it's kind of reverse engineering. Uh, the fishes I'll be talking about are spring chinook and winter steelhead. Uh, the seasons really relate to when the adults come back, not when the juveniles go out. And then I'll talk a little bit also about bull trout. Um, what I'll do in my talk is introduce why we're doing this. And then I'll get into a little bit on how we're doing it, how we test our methods, and then how we test our results. And we'll talk a little bit about both lab tests and field tests. And I hardly have uh, enough time to go into any of these in detail. So this will be a fairly broad but cursory uh, discussion. And you feel free to, you know, to shout at me with questions. But before I launch into that, Bo asked if I give a little bit of background on why this is all happening and uh, how that relates to 
the uh, Oregon Hatchery Research Center. So we all recognize that we need to have fishing. We need to have fishing for the public, for angling, and there needs to be commercial fishing. So that's a given, we need to have fish. Now, there've been a lot of problems though, uh, throughout the world, unfortunately, regarding conservation and the um, reason that fishes are declining are broad. You guys know those as well as I do, but in our neck of the woods, there's lots of big dams like shown here. And then we also have some massive hatcheries that you can see here that basically are there to replace the fish that no longer can migrate up above these dams. I'm cold and I'm hungry and I see humans around a bonfire. Maybe I could ask for food. What could possibly go wrong? And you can see what happened 30,000 years later. Well, in cases of fishes and other animals for that matter, domestication selection doesn't take 30,000 years. It's very, very fast. And that's really one of the problems maybe with regard to hatcheries. If one generation of a hatchery fish mates with another hatchery fish after they've come back from the ocean, but spawns in the wild, you get a 25% reduction in reproductive fitness. And if a one generation fish from a hatchery mates with a wild fish, you get a 12 and a half percent reduction in reproductive fitness. And this has been shown in a number of different species, but it can also be a big deal then if fishes are listed under ESA. So it's possible that hatcheries are having a negative effect. I say possible because this is still pretty controversial. Most scientists agree that hatcheries probably are producing a depression in reproductive fitness, but the jury is still out on that. So we really need to have conservation as well. We don't just need to have fish, but we need to have conservation of these fish. And you all know that the Endangered Species Act requires for vertebrates that we make sure that distinct population segments don't get threatened or become extinct. Because of the possible listing of Oregon salmonids under ESA, Oregon tried to get ahead of that by creating an Oregon plan for salmon and watersheds. And this plan basically is so big it'll like fill a box with paper. Uh, but the whole idea was if Oregon can figure out how to prevent these fishes from going extinct, then they won't need federal listing. That would make the whole process so much easier for people at the state level. So the Oregon plan of salmon watersheds created watershed districts. Uh, they work with landowners trying to rehabilitate streams and that sort of thing. But the feds listed the salmon anyway. And so that then led to the native fish conservation policy that the state has, which is basically how they would go about trying to preserve these different uh, ESUs. And as part of that, there emerged the need to understand differences between hatchery and wild fish. You know, so if hatcheries might have a negative effect on wild fish, we need to understand why are they different? How are they different? We need to figure out how we can have both hatchery and wild fish. We need to conserve the wild fish, but we also need to provide hatchery fish for the fishery. And then we also need to educate the public on how to do that. So these three um, needs are basically the mission of the Oregon Hatchery Research Center. The state at the time when the Oregon uh, plan was, was formed decided they needed to have an ability to figure out how to meet those three needs. And they created a virtual center that has a facility. I'm showing you an early picture of this facility. And uh, very unfortunately, a couple of years ago, there was a massive landslide upstream that caused the water to be so silty here that this facility is now shut down for the next couple of years until they figure out how to make it really work. And I know Seth White is probably going to give you another webinar on this. He's the director of that facility. So I'm not gonna dive into this uh, in any detail at all, just to say that we do a lot of our research here and we grow some of the fish that we're trying to produce uh, at this facility. So that gets us in then to what we call our surrogate wild Chinook and steelhead project. And I'll introduce bull trout a little bit later. This project is basically a project through the USGS and the co-op unit, the university and the state as well. And it's funded by the US Army Corps of Engineers. And the reason is that in watersheds such as the Willamette River Basin, and that's where we're doing this work, and this is a very large basin. The, it's second only, I think, to Niagara Falls in terms of volume of water that flows over the, uh, the waterfall. There's a lot of dams. And these are high head dams. They impair anatomous passage upstream, they impair passage downstream. And then we have declines in the wild Chinook and steelhead populations, and they got listed. And then we also have hatchery fish in the system. So what you see here is a map of the basin. The river flows from the south 
to the north end of the Columbia River. And each black dot here basically represents a major dam. And so each of these tributaries to the main stem of Lamette basically has what you could consider an ESU. And so you want to manage these, even though the whole thing is one big ESU or, or meta population, each one of these needs to be managed separately and kept genetically distinct. Some of the dams have adult passage going upstream, as you can see in the lower left picture, but none of the dams really have juvenile passage to get the fish down through the dams if they spawn upstream. So basically juveniles, if they're spawned upstream because there's adult passage or where there's not adult passage, the fish are, the adults are trapped and then transported up around the dams. So the fish from upstream have to face a unique reservoir habitat they didn't co-evolve with. They face altered fish communities and then they have to somehow get through a dam. And then the Corps of Engineers is by mandate required to figure out how to get the juveniles down. Uh, so there's just a cartoon here of a fish passage system. Uh, so many of these fish in the systems are listed under ESA, which basically means they're not available for people to study in the wild. So if you're going to try to figure out how to get a fish through the dam, you need to have some sort of animal that you can use that would represent the wild fish because you can't get your mitts on the wild fish because of the listing. And so those are the surrogate fish that we're trying to produce. With regard to bull trout, we worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the idea was there. Could we basically bring listed bull trout into a culture facility, grow them to be wild-like, so they could be stocked out in the wild again? It's very much like the California condor idea. So that's how the bull trout got involved in this. So we know that hatchery fish are different than wild fish, and therefore we have to have something that would represent the wild fish. And they're different in behavior, morphology, physiology, and genetics. And that gets us to my lab. The Corps of Engineers, Engineers asked if we could do this, and we said we think we can. And so these are the main players here with Oregon, um, the Corps, uh, the co-op unit, and then the university. So the Wild Fish Surrogate Project basically is to produce juvenile salmonids in an artificial environment that look and act more like wild fish. It takes a bunch of really talented people to do this, and we've been very lucky to have a great staff for these projects. And by the way, this has been going on for roughly 15 years, and these people have been with us roughly that long. And we also do this work under extreme animal care scrutiny. We have to raise our animals so they basically meet the university and the national standards for animal care and use. And so we have to write IACOCs. But we're also an accredited laboratory through ALAC, which basically accredits um, laboratories internationally, uh, and they're as rigorous as those that use primates as animals. So the, the care that we give our fish are, uh, I think, really, really tender, loving type of care. So most of this work is actually done at the Fish Performance and Genetics Laboratory. This is a co-op unit run facility at the university. It's in Corvallis, uh, and it's basically um, a soft money facility that I started and, and, uh, and supported. So, you know, anything that happens here is money that we have to bring in. And, uh, We've been very lucky that it's been very perfect for this facility. Uh, we have on the left uh, indoor laboratories and the right is an indoor rearing area. Uh, everything, and I'm mentioning this because I know very little about coragonids, but you are, I think, talking about maybe growing coragonids like this. Everything you have needs to be backed up. So you see backed up pumps on the left. This is a hand dug well, 39 feet deep. We have backup aeration towers, backup cooling systems, and then backup generators for the electricity. So it's really important to have everything backed up. And then we have a lot of indoor rearing facilities with replica tanks for experiments, also troughs. We have incubation rooms. We have another set of these in another place. And then we have a very extensive outdoor rearing facility that you can see here. And we recommend growing wildlife fish out of doors. They turn out to be just a better reared fish than if you try to grow them indoors. And it's probably related to the uh, the natural lighting compared to some of the artificial lighting. We also have indoor lab space for the users of our fish. So people from the USGS or the state or Pacific Northwest National Labs that are actually using our fish will come to our facility and plant radio tags or acoustic tags or that sort of stuff, and then stock these fish out into the wild. We also have space where we do experiments, and I'll talk about some of these experiments in a second. Very fortunately for us, we're adjacent to it's called the John Fryer Aquatic Animal Health Lab. My lab, a uh, little piece of it sticking out there in the upper left, uh, in the, the left-hand slide, 
right? The disease lab basically is there so you can treat animals with pathogens then figure out the effects of the pathogens on the well-being of the animal that you're working with. And this is now where the uh, Oregon Hatchery Research Center has its laboratory facilities. So going back a long time uh, in terms of thinking about how we might go about rearing these fish, I had been working with Fish and Wildlife Service at Willard National Fish Hatchery. And we raised fish in raceways at production densities. That's the H density, meaning high, one third lower, meaning medium density, and a low density, which would be two thirds lower than the, the, you know, the production hatchery density. So these fish were reared their whole lives like that up until release time. And to the hatchery managers and staff, they looked perfect. There was no difference between them. The fish all look great. They all have the same size and so forth, same survivorship. But it turned out that if you look at the difference between the high, medium, and low fish, how, how they would survive a pathogen they encounter on the way downstream, the lower the density, the higher the survivorship. So the fish were different. And then when these fish were released to the ocean, there was an inverse correlation between density and return rate. So that told us that we need to really worry about density you know, when we're trying to grow a more wild-like fish. So the goal then that we have in trying to rear and deliver these wild fish surrogates are first of all, to establish and refine the fish needs of target researchers. You have to figure out what it is you're trying to produce a fish like. Then we had to evaluate the quality and the phenotypic accuracy. We had to describe the phenotypes of naturally produced fish and hatchery produced fish. And then we had to figure out how to produce those target phenotypes. That's what I'm going to chat about now. The last two are actually part of the mission of the Oregon Hatchery Research Center. And it's very different than ordering something on Amazon. It's much more like ordering something that's like a Lamborghini because it takes about two years because we think that life history in these fish is determined very early on. And so we actually start with the eggs. And so many of these fish are reared by us for a year and a half or two years. But what might make them more wildlife is actually maybe happening very, very early in their, in their lives. So we're all familiar with these uh, models of salmon life history that you guys have them in the Great Lakes as well. But it's actually much, much more complicated than this. You know, we're all sort of taught this textbook view. And I think that's kind of unfortunate because what's really important is the variation that a species can have and how it goes about its business of going, for example, from freshwater to the ocean and back. And if we look, for example, at the freshwater rearing life histories of juvenile Chinook salmon in the Willamette River Basin, what this basically is, is a map that goes from spawning tributaries upstream on the top to migrating to the ocean at the bottom. And then it's a calendar going from left to right for about a year and a half. And what you can see is that there are fish that are spawned upstream that as fry migrate to the main river and then all the way down to the estuary. And we have others that migrate partway down and then hang out for a while and migrate down at different times. And then we also have fish that stay the whole time in the spawning tributaries and will then migrate out later. Now, the two main groups of fish that are involved here are the fall migrants and the spring migrants. So it's a sub yearling and a yearling. So those are the target phenotypes that we have for the surrogate project. But it's important to recognize that there's all these other possibilities out there. We don't know what drives them. What is it that would take the fish and turn it into one that spends a year and a half in a spawning tributary versus one that migrates straight out to the ocean? You know, there's something about the habitat and the environment. And we think a lot of that's related to growth rate. Um, at any rate, we're concentrating on the last two because that's what the, the researchers are concerned with at the dams. Then we have to figure out what is the genetic stock they need. We have to figure out what size of fish they need because they need to be like wild fish when they're there. And we also need to figure out when they need these fish because they're trying to time their studies at the exact same time when the wild fish would be there. So just for example, the Mackenzie is a tributary to the Willamette. A researcher might want fish on October 1, November 1, and on December 1, and they want them all to be 12 centimeters because that's the size of the wild fish that happen to be migrating at that time. And then again, they maybe want the yearling migrants of that same stock in April, May, and June. They want them to be just slightly bigger than they were in the, in the fall. So we have to raise all these groups differently and try to get them to these targets. And then we do the same thing for other basins, and so forth. So how do we do this? Well, we start out with spring Chinook where we get eggs from hatcheries. And the hatcheries use an integrator brood stock, meaning they get wild spawners, bring them into the hatchery and spawn them. So our eggs are relatively wild. 
for winter steelhead, there are no hatcheries that raise winter steelhead. And so we have to go basically uh, to a trapping facility like this one here and catch the adults and then spawn them ourselves. And then we start with wild steelhead eggs in a rearing facility. So this is a basic map of the tactics that we use and we're testing. And it's a uh, very um, simplistic of what we're actually doing. But the whole idea is that we want surrogate natural origin fish, and we have to worry about the early life history, and we have to worry about the environmental variable to control those. And for the environmental variables, we change the diet, we change the tank environment, and we use temperature. And then depending on how we do that, that affects the lipid content of the fish. We also use a different feeding strategy than how to feed them, feed them like you might get at a hatchery. We add substrate and structure to our tanks. We worry about density. And then we also have constant and variable temperatures. Now those then can affect different phenotypes like movement timing uh, and so forth. And then that then can also affect if fish are growing too fast. It's very common for our salmon to become precocious. I don't know if, if corrigonids do that, but many of our hatcheries sometimes, half the males can be precocious at six inches, not migrate to the ocean at all. So at any rate, by following all these different lines, hopefully we'll achieve the, the phenotypes that we need. So one of the most important things that we do is try to grow the fish like they might be grown in the wild. So if you look at a wildlife growth pattern, they basically grow faster in the summer and in the winter. So we do that. We try to emulate this. We do that by controlling the temperature and by the quality of the diet and how we deliver that diet. And then we also change density and we have structure and cover. We start with eggs that are hatched under gravel, not in incubation systems like you would in a hatchery. And we also like the use of shade cloth like you can see in the upper left here, uh, because I think that creates different patterns as the sun moves across the sky and creates a variable environment in the tank. And then we also use in-tank structure. Uh, and these are very simple structures actually designed by hatchery people for us, because this way, if you were to do this on a large scale, you, they're very easy to clean and, and so forth. It's not like throwing in big rocks or trees or something like that. And they seem to work very well. So with regard to the diet, we use a low lipid diet that's called the Wild Chinook Grower Diet. And that was designed for us by the Fish and Wildlife Service um, folks at Bozeman, Montana that are very much into diet development. And it's a lower lipid diet, higher in protein diet. And another thing that we believe is extremely important is how we deliver the diet. We use what we call adaptive feeding. So we weigh out the amount of food that you need for about six days to get the growth that you need over that six day period. But then we feed varying amounts of different times and it's not satiation feeding. So it's more or less the fish behavior telling us, do they want to eat or not? And if they're a little bit slow on their food, maybe we don't feed them at all. Or if they really eat a lot, then maybe they don't have enough food at the end of that sixth day to get fed. Uh, so it's extremely variable, much more like what you get in the wild. The um, incubation, like I said, uh, is done in an artificial red. And these diets do make a difference. Well, we've tested diets, for example, where we've experimented with four to six percent lipid, eight to nine percent lipid. The Chinook grower diet that we settled on was 11, 12 percent. And then an extra diet that Bozeman wanted to test that was really a fatty diet. And they were comparing all these to the commercial diet that you find in a hatchery. And of course, there's big differences. The green line here represents the length of fish fed of the commercial hatchery diet. And what you can see is the fish fed the lower lipid diets basically have a lower growth rate, which is exactly what we want to achieve because a wild fish is much smaller than a, than a hatchery fish. So from these sort of experiments, we can look at condition factor, the same thing that our fish have a lower condition factor, which is again, very much like a wild fish compared to a hatchery fish that is, that is fatter. If you look at the lipid content of wild fish, there's very, unfortunately very little information on this. I don't know how much there is on your corrigonids through time, but what we have here are fish collected at two different times of the year, the different colored bars there from different, re from different reservoirs. There's about five different reservoirs there. And so if you try to figure out what's the average lipid in a wild fish, you could come up with a line. And so basically the lipids in a wild fish um, would be like the bars that you see under wild on the left, or surrogate fish are in between, and then hatchery fish are, are 
have a higher body lipid content. That's because of the nature of the diet that we feed it and how we feed it. The high lipid, uh, high protein, low lipid diet also helps prevent precociousness. We've completely solved the precocious problem in our Chinook by feeding this way. Uh, unfortunately, we're still struggling with this somewhat in steelhead. We do better than hatcheries with steelhead, but they're still they tend to be more precocious. Uh, anyway, you can see the, the data comparing um, commercial and experimental diets on precociousness with the gray bars being the, uh, the commercial diet and the black bars being our Chinook grower diet. And then GSI, gonadosomatic index, basically, is how precocious the, the gonad is. And if you compare growth, which is an example here of a growth pattern in a reservoir in the blue line, and you can see that our surrogate fish are grown sort of halfway between, or even some, in some cases actually are more identical to the, to the wild fish than the red line, which represents the, the growth of, of wild fish, of um, hatchet fish, excuse me. So when we try to get at desired movement phenotypes, some people want to study PAR, some people want to study sub-yearlings or yearlings or even two-year-old smolts. And so we have to establish how are we going to do this? We do that by changing density, lipid, how complex the environment is, and so forth. And then we have to figure out how can we achieve the different growth patterns that you can see in the bars over here to produce the phenotypes that are expected on the left. And then that basically gives us um, the different characteristics that, that we need. So if we try to figure out how does a hatchery fish and a surrogate fish and a wild fish compare morphologically, if we use landmark-based geomorphometrics, what we found is that the wild fish on the top, that's the black lines on the, on the right-hand side, and our surrogate fish, they're very similar in body shape. Bodies are almost the same. But if you look at the hatchery fish compared to the wild fish, that's the bottom uh, outline tracing, they're very quite different. So a hatchery fish has a more rounded head, a fatter body, the wild fish more pointed snout, thinner body. So these particular areas here are particularly important. You can think, well, you're feeding them differently, therefore it's all due to lipid, but that's not necessarily the case because with the skull, the skull of a wild fish and the skull of a surrogate fish actually has different growth, particularly of the ethmoid bone. So it's actually a structural thing. It's not just because how much fat's there, but the fish is actually growing differently. The other thing that's different between hatchery and wild fish are the fins. If you look at the hatchery fish on the left, you can see how rounded the caudal fin is, whereas they're much more pointy in the surrogate fish and in the wild fish. And we actually quantified that. And sure enough, it turns out that you know, the hatchery fish is much more rounded. But the other thing that we did was compare the size of the lobes, the upper lobe and the lower lobe. And what you have here is with the horizontal line across the middle of this graph, if the data overlap that, then the two lobes are the same size. But what we found is that the hatchery fish actually has a larger upper lobe. We don't know what that means for swimming, but you know, it's probable that it has some sort of effect. Uh, so we not only get differences in the shape, but also in the dimensions of the fins. There's also problems with fin erosion. And I don't know anything about how aggressive corrigonids are, but steelhead are very aggressive. And we basically solved the fin erosion problem with our Chinook, by the way we grow them. And we're still working on this with the steelhead. But a really good way to visualize this is by exposing them to a fluorescein stain and then looking at them under UV. And so what you're looking at here are the dorsal fans of a bunch of steelhead lined, oops, lined up. And you can see the, the, flor, uh, the fluorescence of the fluorescence. And so what this is is broken protein. This is a stain for broken protein. So it's a good way to quantify how damaged the fins are. And what's even better is clear and staining. You can see an undamaged fin on the left and you can see how, how a damaged fin compares. And this allows us then to sort of quantify how damaged the fins are. So if you come up with a fin quality index by representing damage, what you can see is that the hatchery fish in the white have much poorer fin quality than the surrogate fish or the, or the wild fish. So we've solved this with Chinook and we're partway there with, with steelhead. With steelhead, it's a really big deal because you can see how this adult that's come back. Yes, the fin's regenerated to some extent, but it's really not exactly the way a, a wild fish would look.
I mentioned social interactions because I think what's driving a lot of this fin damage is the fact that steelheads are very hierarchical and there's a lot of nipping going on. That's not so much the case with steelhead. So when you're growing this fish, it'd really be good to understand with core gonads, you know, how social they are and do they get along and play well together. That relates to how you use structure and all that sort of thing. We've published a lot of this work. If anybody cares to, you can contact me later and I can send you publications on it. But let's turn to behavior because what we're really trying to do is see how these fish move as they go through the reservoirs and the dams and then what you can do about it and how a core might build a better bypass facility. So we're asking questions like, are the fish, hatchery fish, surrogates, and wild fish motivated the same to be near conspecifics or not? You know, like, do they want to be in a school? And then also, what's the latency to explore novel environments? And what we found is that hatchery fish are different than the surrogate fish, and the surrogate fish are like the wild fish. And you can see that pretty well here. Hatchery fish tend to be more schooling. Surrogate fish are more spread out. But we were able to quantify that by testing them in an arena like this. What you're looking down on is a chamber where the fish starts on the far right uh, in a holding uh, pen. A gate is lifted. The fish then can go across the adverse zone. Fish don't like to cross big white lit up areas to get conspecifics on the far left. And uh, so basically, we were able to find that the um, motivation to get the conspecifics is much higher in the hatchery fish. And the wild fish and the surrogate fish are much more, uh, I, see, I, I see this as being more cautious in times of emerging to explore a novel environment. The other thing we found, interestingly enough, is that there's a difference in the later phenotype that you get if you start with a small egg or a big egg. So in a female, you could actually sort eggs into small and big. And what turns out you know, is that fry from a small egg actually outgrow the fry from a big egg, so they're larger at smolting. And so we know that basically larger smolts have a higher survivorship. So, you know, so that's why I mentioned what happens really early in life has some effect on later phenotypes, and that relates to fitness. So the summary of this is basically that phenotypic differences expressed early in life lead to phenotypic uh, differences expressed later, and that those probably relate to migration timing, like the size of fish. And that early growth probably drives this migratory behavior that we're studying. Another thing that we found was really interesting when we're working at lower densities um, is that fish in tanks, and these are Chinook salmon, actually sort themselves. There's a top layer and a bottom layer. What you can see here is the bottom layer, and then there's fish in the water column and some fish up high. Uh, but this is real. And what's interesting about this is if you sort them and take just the top fish or just the bottom fish, they persist. They persist for a year, no matter where you feed them, top or bottom, they persist. This isn't the case so much with steelhead or, or brown trout where fish that are at the bottom will move up into the top. Um, again, maybe that relates to aggressiveness and that sort of thing. But we say, this is interesting here, yeah, but sort of, so what? Why should we care about this? Well, again, if you do a morphological analysis of these fish, what we find is there's a difference between the surface fish and the bottom fish in their shape. And if we look at wild morphology, a fall migrant is different than a spring migrant in shape. And fish you find downstream, which would be the fall migrants, are different than the fish you find upstream. And what's interesting is that our surface fish have the shape of the fall migrants, and the spring uh, migrants look like our bottom fish. So we were thinking maybe what we could do is just sort fish into fall deliverables and spring deliverables by just sorting the layers within our, within our tanks. Now, turning out of bull trout, we've done more or less the same thing where we raise them with an enhanced habitat and a conventional habitat, and you see different colors that you get out of these different habitats, but that's, I don't think, really a big deal. But we were able to look at the brains in these fish. And at the um, Oregon Health Sciences Center, they actually have an MRI that's 10 billion times more powerful than you get with a hospital MRI. And so the brains of the fish that we're looking at, you know, they're about the size of your little fingernail, even smaller, so you needed something that was powerful. So we could actually map the brains, the sort of Chinook salmon being sliced, and you can see the green outline of the brain, and you could look at brain parts. But the bottom line is that we could then figure out how big the brains are in these fish. And it turns out that wild fish have the biggest brains, 
by size. That's the, the white dots, in the upper line. The surrogates are in between, and then the hatchy fish have the smallest brains. And that's really interesting, but again, you say, so what? Well, we ran tests and found that the wild fish and the fish that were grown like surrogates were bolder and were better predators. We're actually able to test predation ability by how many steelhead fry could they consume per unit time. And so the wild fish and the surrogates, yes, it's correlation that the brains are bigger, but it sure seems to us that the, you know, the, having a big brain is, is a good deal. Um, and we've also been testing the effects of structure. And something that we found relatively recently is that if you grow fish on structures that you can see here and then stress them, and what we did was a three-hour simulated transport stressor because a lot of our fish are taken from our facility, tagged, and then transported somewhere. It takes about three hours. We took them from the rearing containers on the top on the left there, moved them to shallow water in smaller tanks, much like being in a truck for three hours. And then we put them back in those tanks that they originally came from. And we looked at plasma cortisol as an index of stress. And the lower lines represent the control. So you can see cortisol is very low, no stress going on here. And that the lines on top are much uh, reflective of stress. But what's interesting, oops. sorry about that. Oops. What's interesting, is that the fish that were grown with structure had a lower stress response, and that's the, the green line, and they were also recovered quicker from the same stressor as the fish that were uh, raised without structure. And uh, these are triplicated experiments and so forth. I'm just showing you the summary of the data. So then we asked the question, what happens if we have fish with structure and without structure? Those are the, some tanks have the X's in them, some don't. And we did this at regular hatchery densities versus conservation hatchery densities or surrogate densities did the exact same experiment. And what we found was, again, the control fish from all four rearing groups were shown at the bottom are unstressed. The fish that were raised at low density had the exact same result as we found in the previous experiment that I showed you with the fish with structure having lower stress response and quicker recovery than those higher. And then the fish at the higher density had a greater stress response, but again, structure seemed to mitigate for the effect of the stressor. So what we conclude from this is that in-tank in structure and low density reduces stress, in-tank structure appears to moderate the effects of density, and the lack of tank, tank structure in high density is not inherently stressful, but those fish are less prepared for future stressors they might encounter when you release them into the wild. Part of the work that we've done also looked at parasitic copepods. And the reason for this is these reservoirs have created an unnatural environment that allows this pathogen to greatly infect fish. And you can see some in the, the gill cavities here, on the, on the fins here. And so the question is, if you're going to move a fish through a reservoir and wild fish are infected, you also have to have infected surrogate fish. So we actually did that for some researchers. And we also found then if you Look at swimming ability of infected fish. These are laboratory studies, basically in swim tubes. Uninfected fish were able to swim a long time at high velocity. Each dot represents an individual fish. Fish that we artificially infected in the lab had a lot of fish that couldn't hardly swim at all. And the size of the dot represents how infected they were. And then if you go to the reservoir and take wild fish and test them, they can't swim at all. So it's really unfortunate that, you know, yes, these fish are persisting, but they're not going to be able to face any challenge if they you know, have to sprint away from a predator or anything like that. And they also turns out that fish that are infected with these copepods can't regulate salt water. What you can see here uh, are results with salt water challenges where we put fish into salt water for 24 hours. Controls had the mortality shown by that black line, almost no mortality. And fish infected with high and low uh, amounts of copepods basically. Uh, at least at warmer temperatures, none of those fish could really regulate salt water. So that's not a good thing if you're smoke going to the ocean and can't survive in, in salt water. So we actually provided these fish to researchers, uh, fish going through dams in a simulated bypass system. Uh, and the results are still out on this. Uh, but the bottom line is that, again, our, our surrogate fish are acting much like what we think the wild fish are doing. Uh, this shows you how infected the fish can be. And if you ever work with this sort of thing, 
Um, these are the adult, the, the egg sacs from the adult copepod, but it's really juvenile stage that's probably even having more damage. So we see a lot of gills are eroded, but you can't see any copepods on them. And that's because the, the, the juveniles have done it and you need to look at those through a microscope. I, I mention this because you need to understand the system that your fish are going to be planted into. So you don't just need to understand what's the difference between a hatchery corrigonid and a wild corrigonid, but also how is that fish going to survive when it gets out into the environment? So you have to have a pretty holistic picture of what's going on out there. And then the other thing we discovered is that these copepods appear to be vectors for other pathogens like frunculosis. Um, so it's like getting a double whammy. You're getting your gills chewed up and at the same time, you're maybe being uh, infected with a bacterial pathogen that's being transmitted by the, by the copepod. So you need to understand the destination watersheds. I think that's, that's really important. So trying to get at the, the phenotypic variation that's present in the behavioral phenotypes moving beyond the lab correlations, we've done work at the Hatchery Research Center, and we've also looked in the field. In the Hatchery Research Center, they have some wonderful replicate artificial streams, and we've basically compared our surrogate fish and fish with structure, no structure in these streams, and we'd stock them, let them adjust, and we'd lift gates, and then they could migrate out if they wanted to migrate out. And what we found out that downstream movement was associated with rain events, which is what you'd expect for a wild fish. Downstream movement happens at night, what you'd expect for the wild fish. Movement were significantly larger than stairs in the streams. But what was really important is the wild fish surrogates were more likely to move at all sizes compared to the hatchery standard. So that again is really important for us because the researchers want these fish to move like when the wild fish move and those fish are variable in size compared to the hatchery fish. We don't know the effect of structure. Um, those experiments didn't work well because something basically uh, got in there and caused the fish to, to, to jump out. I don't know if an otter got in there or what happened, but uh, we had no results there. So we tried to simulate this kind of condition in the lab in Corvallis where we created an arena system. This is looking down on it with pit tags so we can have fish and water movement going this direction so a fish can move upstream or downstream. And the round tanks represent pools. That's what the system looks like. And we found that it seems to be working. So we want to use this kind of system to test our um, surrogates in the near future. And then we could figure out, for example, what is the right density, or, you know, how important is structure, that kind of thing. Found there's a lot of non-directional movement. And then like you would expect in wild fish, they move in the spring. We have done four releases into the wild with our surrogate fish. Um, two in, a, in the North San Am, it's a place called Minto, two into the Mackenzie. And the whole idea was that we could compare different treatments, for example, egg size, and we could tag juveniles when they were small with, with fluorescent dye, and we can implant pit tags, and then later on listen for the pit tags downstream at pit tag arenas. And uh, so these pit tag arenas aren't run by us. They're, they're run by either power companies or different agencies. And so we'd look for our fish that were released. And the idea was we could sort of then track the, the movement of these fish. And we looked at emergence timing, self-sorting the top and bottom fish, egg size, and self-sorting in egg size. And uh, very unfortunately, there, we have no results from this because in no case did the pit tag arrays really do what they were supposed to do. So we're or tag recoveries were, were very, very small. It's because they, there was always something environmental that happened with the pit tag readers didn't, didn't work. But we did go find our fish in with the wild fish. So at least they used the same habitat. But we do have results from the end users of a fish. These are the, the folks that are using our, our fish uh, to test how they might go through a reservoir and a dam. And what they found is that in, for example, in Cougar Reservoir, the passage efficiency of our fish is 93%. So that's really good. We feel like we're giving them a fish that will pass and then they can figure out how to get that fish safely passed through the dam. In another reservoir, we found that 60% of our fish outmigrated at the exact same time that wild fish would outmigrate. And of course, not all wild fish migrate out either. So 60%, I think, is, is very good saying we're getting a high percentage um, of what we want. And then I think also, showing that our surrogate fish are, are very good uh, wildlife representatives, is that if you put juveniles into the reservoir, the distribution pattern of these fish 
correlates very closely with the distribution of the wild fish. In other words, if the wild fish move down towards the dam, our fish move down. If the wild fish move back upstream, our fish move back upstream. So the researchers are very happy with the fish that we've produced. And basically what we've shown then is the body shape is more wildlife, other regulations more wildlife, physiology, behavior, genetics, fin quality, and so forth is, is more wildlife. And because of that, research have now used, uh, not counting this year, for 100,000 wild Chinook and, uh, and 70,000 wild steelhead uh, that we've given to those different user groups there. And we've also provided uh, 50,000 wild surrogates for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to use very much like the condor program where they're trying to re replenish population in a depleted river. And we provide thousands of fish for the anglers to catch. So with that, I'll close and just offer that it's really important to understand all the different parts. You know, how to raise a wildlife fish understands the wild fish and their habitat. And I think what's also really important is not to forget the importance of variation. Like I showed you how variable the life history pattern of a Chinook salmon really is. So just like having different species concept as your toolbox in your, in your Swiss Army knife is important for maintaining functionality of habitat, it's also important, I think, for persistence of species to have the ability to express different um, wildlife phenotypes and that we're trying not to select for just certain ones because it, there's maybe other times when they'd need to do something slightly different. Uh, I'm showing my email address here, just my name with a period in between it, at oregonstate.edu. So if you have any questions you want to ask me afterwards, you're welcome to uh, email me. And with that, though, I'm not sure how we are time-wise, but I'd be pleased to answer questions. Thanks very much, Carl. It was fantastic. Uh, I can say that I'm really happy that you agreed that this could be recorded so I can go back and... Uh, study some of my notes again and some of the things you said. It was just an amazing diversity of experiments that you shared and outcomes. And um, some of the take-home things for me were some of the, you know, you talked about very early on, even at the egg stage, things can maybe perhaps be set. The importance of diet, uh, substrate or structure, temperature, light even being outside. There's a lot for us to think about. And, and I think one of your main points about, you've got to know, of course, what the environment, what the goal is, what the environment is, and, and to understand, you know, you were trying to create wildlife fish for researchers. Um, and in our case, we're trying to essentially restore these native prey fishes. So some of the things we think might be important would be probably to maintain schooling, for example, um, probably to be wary of predators. And if there's some way we can sort of do that in the lab, that might be a helpful thing to essentially maximize their survival. And so, um, but but in general, there's just a whole lot that uh, I think we can take in, consider, think about. And for those in the Great Lakes, you know, I failed to mention that we're really excited about sort of taking this perspective uh, at our Tunison uh, USGS lab, and it's and it's a partnership lab that we're envisioning. It's we're building this and these ideas with Fish and Wildlife and with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and with New York State DEC and the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe local agency partners. So there's a lot of similarities to what has been developed. Um, you know, in Oregon over the past several decades. And we're just at the forefront of thinking about these ideas for Corrigonians and the Great Lakes. And this was a fantastic seminar. We'll open it up for questions. Again, for questions, people can um, either pop their cameras on uh, or raise your hand in the chat or uh, type a, a question in the chat would be the best way to do that. And Carl has agreed to stay on. Um, you know, for the next 10 to 20 minutes, uh, as long as the discussion goes. Maybe while we're waiting for one, Carl, I, I didn't hear you talk about sort of uh, predation. You know, you're, I'm certain there is predation risk for these young salmon, um, but that didn't seem to be something that came up in terms of something you were trying to aim for as a target. Um, can you sort of talk about why maybe that didn't come up or 
what sort of rearing characteristics you might know about that we could be thinking about in the Great Lakes to try to minimize that or make them more wary of predators once they are released into the wild? Yeah, a lot of our end users are working under relatively short periods of time. Um, more of, you know, if you're thinking of a, a small migrant, how long are they in the reservoir? How long does it take them to get through a dam? So there's really not that huge opportunity mm -hmm. for predation. Um, something that I think different in the Great Lakes than what we have is that we've discovered that probably the, the single most important place for predation is right at the freshwater saltwater interface that you can have over 50% predation rate in the last kilometer and a half of a little river. And that's birds. Uh, so, you know, so it's, there, I think the greater mortality happens a little bit later um, in terms of how much per unit time. Yeah. Um, there's been some research, we've never worked on this, but there's been a fair number of studies, fair number being, you know, three, four, five, something like that. Um, where people have tried to train fish to avoid predators, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and I think that there's mixed results on those. I can think of one where they seem to show that they were better at it, but I, I'm not so sure. And others, were, you know, they couldn't find any beneficial effect of, of uh, art and hardening the fish. Um, but while we didn't work on uh, predation, what I can tell you is that you can actually stress harden fish by conditioning them to both mentally and physically um, handle stress better. So if you give, so just like in people, you know, if you, if you give them um, a, a mild stress, then it builds up their cardiovascular system and that sort of stuff. But it also builds up their mental ability saying, hey, I'm tough. I can withstand this. It's not so big a deal. And uh, so those fish have better disease resistance, resist low oxygen levels better, you know, that sort of thing. You know, so there are ways you can harden your fish. That could be done in a yeah. hatch easily. Yeah, you're even showing how they're getting bigger brains. <laughs> that yeah. was phenomenal too. Yeah. yeah. Um, Very so hard for us to do predation studies now uh, because of the animal care stuff. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, so when do you least stop? As a question for you. Are you able to unmute, Wendy? There, I think I got it. Did that, can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you now. Okay, um, great presentation. I, I, you may not be doing this or maybe you have and you might have some thoughts. One thing that in past research I we tried to look at and maybe something I need to look at again was along these lines of, you know, training them to behave more like wild fish. And one thing that we had looked at in the past was sort of the, you know, you give them food, you can adjust the lipid content, but also kind of training them to recognize food things that aren't all the same size and shape. Um, have you, and you know, we were like sort of the equivalent of sort of an aquatic forage toy. Um, have you guys ever done anything along those lines that you might be able to share with us? No, that's, uh... What you're saying makes an awful lot of sense to me. Um, and we haven't done that because we have to have fish on certain growth rates as well. And, uh, you know, so feeding the way we do is the best way that we can achieve that. Um, but in, in your case, I don't think you have to worry so much about that. Uh, you know, you may be better off having variability that something like that would create within a population. Yeah, and also like... And, and relating it, I guess, to brain development is important because in, you know, in land vertebrates where you can actually adjust it a little more easily, that also has an impact on how well their brains develop. So just kind of yeah. how to do that in an, in an aquatic environment, you know, is kind of something that we've been thinking about. Yeah, I think it's worth trying. Yeah. We have um, done experiments where we, where we had... Um, natural foods frozen in ice cubes and thrown those in but you know it wasn't in a comparison of hatchy versus wild mm. but that's worked very well for us so they get these slow releases of things in the drift um, thanks wendy
uh, there's a few comments in the chat, one from our uh, center director here at the Great Lakes Science Center in Ann Arbor. Um, really enjoyed your presentation and he's inviting you out uh, to come potentially spend some time with us at this new Tunison lab if you would you or your team would all be of interest and that's something we had talked about maybe with Seth too so uh, just reiterating how much we're appreciating sort of these interactions and conversations um, yeah, that's something we can certainly talk about okay um Bruce Morrison uh, appreciated the presentation um Andrew Hanzi, uh, thank you for the presentation. You might be able to see these too. Uh, can you please talk a little bit more about the structures that you included in the rearing environments? Uh, you had some of the man-made structures that you mentioned were built by uh, more by the hatchery folks because they were easy to clean. How much did you experiment with natural substrates? And can you comment on the pros and cons of the man-made versus natural in the structures? Yeah. Um... So we used um, natural substrates for the eggs and then also as some of the early before we really got into the other structures, uh, used rocks and that sort of thing. Uh, and then the man-made structures, uh, they'd be things like heavy black plastic uh, sheeting that was strung between PVC pipes. Um, and uh, actually it was something actually I did during my PhD work eons mm. ago and it, and it, uh, yeah, you use slightly different configuration, but what's so neat about the plastic is you can just take them out and hose them off and throw them back in. You know, so that, so the rocks are very difficult to clean, uh, and uh, you know, these structures are much easier. And uh, so basically, by you know putting holes in the PVC, they would sink, and you just have to make them heavy enough so they wouldn't drift in the current. By the way, you, I think you also want to always have a. Um, I don't. I would think for co-organets too. Uh, uh, we, we find that round rearing containers are better than linear rearing containers. Mm -hmm. And we find that we want to always have a current for the fish to orient into. It doesn't have to be high, but you, mm -hmm. so you want the structures heavy enough so they wouldn't, you know, drift around in there. Um, yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, Kurt Schilling writes, uh, Kurt is with Fish and Wildlife Service and um, is one of our regional managers. Um, leading the existing Corrigonian rearing that we're doing in the Great Lakes for this restoration project. And, and he's wondering to what extent the Pacific Northwest production hatcheries, state or federal, have been able to adopt some of these techniques on larger scales and if they've actually improved small to adult returns. Uh, to be candid, they really haven't. Um, it's something that's, that they're talking about now and that's, and we would love to do, you know, hatchery scale experiments. But you know, but our we, you know, our funding is basically to provide these fish for researchers, and then we have to do the, the cool science stuff to get there. Um, but um, we ha we we do have hatchery people that are interested in this. I guess maybe the best way of saying it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's some of the relatively new newer facilities that, like what you're talking about. Um, I mean, I guess to that question, what is the um... How much of a reduction in density are you all talking about? Um, is it a twenty-five percent relative to the production hatcheries, or? Yes, yeah, so what we use are, are so we have two kinds of hatcheries. We have production hatcheries that are there to crank out a lot of fish for the fishery, and then we have conservation hatcheries that are also there to crank out fish for the fishery, but also to make sure they don't have a negative effect. And so, where our high density would be the conservation hatchery density, and that depends on species and time of year, and you know, and all that sort of thing. But it's just, um, it's it's a high density compared to what you'd have in the wild, obviously. Um, I can say your wild, your wild surrogate density compared to that high density is that is that easy to say in a percentage or it varies too much by species? It varies. It varies too much. But if you look in, we have a publication that sort of describes. Mm -hmm. I think I sent that to you before. Um, the, the generalities of how we do this. And the, the, then the actual numbers are in there. Okay. Uh, Corey Brandt has his hand up. Yeah. Um, hey, Carl, that was a really awesome, super comprehensive talk. Um, I was really excited by the brain scans too and, and what you're finding there. I was just curious, did the scans include the olfactory system the olfactory bulb or 
or rosette as well? And did you see any differences yeah. in like olfactory structure? No, and those are really good questions. The, the, the trouble is the, um, the brains are so small that the images get too pixelated. And so we tried to get at brain structure, you know, within the brain, but we really couldn't conclude anything from it. So it's a technique problem. And to do that, I think what you'd want to do is histology. Um, the problem with histology is a lot of these sort of projects are kind of bootlegged. That was a student's, you know, part of a student's PhD work. And, uh, you know, while it's important, it's hard to, you know, convince the core they need to put a bunch of money into this. Um, and so with histology, that's it, a lot of individual slides you'd have to read and, and then, you know, scan and figure that out. And that would probably be the better way to do it uh, compared to the, the pixelation that you get with, you know, a computer image. Yeah. You know, yeah, so that good would... enough to get the whole brain. But when you're dealing with, you know, the whole brain is, uh, you know, like I said, not, you know, probably the, the length of your little fingernail, including the olfactory bulbs. Yeah, very, very and small. It's very, you know, it's very narrow. Yeah, so, that makes that makes sense. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to to look at um, just the the I guess the receptiveness those receptors, like uh, maybe doing a electrical factogram or something. Those are really small fish, so yeah. I I understand that I must be really tiny, but really really cool stuff. But actually, they actually um, there's another project going on at the Hatchery Research Center where they are doing the electrical factograms on fish that size or smaller. Oh, really cool. And then, okay. I don't know if you know Andy Dipman, he's involved. He's with Noah and he's doing this. And then Seth White is the PI of that study. And I suspect he'd talk about that when he chats with you guys. Yeah. I think some of our lamprey world might overlap. Yeah. With, with yeah. Yeah. With some of that research, the, the, the sea lamprey is another one where the old factory kind of tells a pretty good story throughout a lot of its life. So yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, what, Seth. what Seth is doing is looking at the uh, uh, imprinting and what are the what are the odorants the fish can recognize. That's how they get into the olfactograms. Yeah. Seth, are you able to unmute? There you go. Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Yeah. I almost completely forgot my comment because olfactory imprinting came up, which is my love language. <laughs> and it <laughs> made me forget, but... um. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to touch on that a, a bit later, um, you know, if there's a later seminar. But I did want to mention, Bo, you made a comment after Carl's excellent presentation that you are you like the idea of like going back to the earliest stages of the life history, starting with the eggs. And I'd encourage you to the core gunning group to look into or maybe it's even a question if you are looking into even further back in the life history, uh, because we're finding mate selection to be a huge potential source of domestication selection as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one project at the Oregon Hatchery Research Center is basically trying to replicate wild-like mate selection based on genome scans, taking a, a wild mate selection database and trying to replicate that at the hatchery, and then releasing those, um, basically tracking those juveniles as they come back as adults and seeing if there's differential reproductive success. And the early results is that the if you allow fish to uh, make their mate selections in a way that wildlife fish would do, that they have a higher return rate and fitness. So uh, that's research that's being done by Michael Banks on coho salmon in the Sandy River. So can you just tell me how that, I mean, how, how are they making mate selection with, like, how, how are you sort of facilitating that mate selection in, in a hatchery setting? Uh, so yeah, full genome scans and, and uh, basically a map of the genome for the wild population and looking at patterns of assortative and disassortative mating and then replicating that in the hatchery as compared to a random selection. And Michael has had a student that wrote a, like a R GUI basically so that they can scan the fish and sit there with the computer and enter the, the genome scan and within a week have um, knowledge of how you would basically match that, uh, that mate to another. So you're not actually allowing yeah. the fish to make a natural selection. You're basically imitating a wildlife okay. mate selection. Based on their genome. Yeah, yep. based on wild genome, non-random 
matching. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. The other really interesting thing that uh, Pouch Research Center is getting into through Seth is epigenetics. Hmm. And we've worried more about genetics, but I think the real action is epigenetic in, in a lot of these things. And how the environment then shapes the expression of the, the genotype. Yeah, and that's certainly very relevant for corgonines and their plasticity that we see all the time. That we can easily express by changing their environment in the labs. So, um, Taylor. Oh, hello, what an amazing body of research. Uh, so amazing to hear about. Uh, I have a question um, and maybe I missed this, but have you looked at sort of how robust some of the, the wildlife rearing is and the rearing to retain or to, you know, uh, encourage those traits? How resistant is that to in like continued domestication? So even if you raise wildlife fish, if you kept them in tanks, maybe to hold them so they're a little bit larger at, at stocking, right? Do they become more domestic over time or is there some optimal balance of getting them in the wild? I, we don't know. It's, good, it's a good question, but we don't know. You know, I was just amazed from the, you know, the studies that I mentioned real early on about how quickly domestication selection happened. You know, one generation, 25% reduction in fitness. That, it's, it's amazing to me. And, uh, you know, so you really could be onto something with your question. I don't know the sorry. Thanks. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, let's see, in the comments, uh, Andrew was just um, saying that, yes, we have definitely found that cor corgonines do best in round tanks, and that's being implemented in our larger production facilities too, larger 15-foot round tanks, as opposed to the raceways. We just get much better survival. Um, are there any final questions for Carl out there? Well, if not, uh, again, thanks for doing this on an early Friday morning. Um, we look forward to future conversations, uh, sharing information from the West Coast here to the Great Lakes. And um, thanks so much for your time. And we will be sharing um, I, I guess I also want to thank Jess for stepping in for Renee. Jess Ives there. Um, Renee is on vacation. Well, yeah, I guess it's vacation in Australia, I believe. Yeah, not work trip. But um, but we will be sending out information about next month's webinar um, within the next couple of weeks. And please reach out to us if you're interested in giving a webinar in what we uh, over in 2024. We do have several openings. And Seth will be in touch with you soon about potentially giving a webinar as well. Thanks again. My pleasure. Bye, everybody.